Number the stars, chapter five. Who is the dark haired one? Do you really think anyone will come? Ellen asked nervously, turning to Anne Marie in the bedroom. Your father doesn't think so. Of course not. They're always threatening stuff. They just like to scare people. Anne Marie took her nightgown from a hook in the closet. Anyway, if they did, it would give me a chance to practice acting. I just pretend to be Lizay. I wish I were taller, though. Ellen stood on tiptoe, trying to make herself tall. She laughed at herself, and her voice was more relaxed. <clears throat> you were great as the Dark Queen in the school play last year, Anne Marie told her. You should be an actress when you grow up. My father wants me to be a teacher. He wants everyone to be a teacher like him. But maybe I could convince him that I should go to acting school. Ellen stood on tiptoe again and made an imperious gesture with her arm. I am the Dark Queen, she intoned dramatically. I've come to command the night. You should try saying I'm Elise Johansson, Anne Marie said, grinning. If you told the Nazis that you were the Dark Queen, they would haul you off into a mental institution. Ellen dropped her actress pose and sat down with her legs curled under her on the bed. They won't come here, do you think? She asked again. Amory shook her head. Not in a million years. She picked up her hairbrush. The girls found themselves whispering as they got ready for bed. There was no need really to whisper. They were, after all, supposed to be normal sisters. And Papa had said they could giggle and talk. The bedroom door was closed. But the night did seem somehow different from a normal night. And so they whispered. How did your sister die, Anne Marie? Ellen asked suddenly. <clears throat> I remember when it happened. And I remember the funeral. It was the only time I'd ever been in a Lutheran church, but I never knew just what happened. I don't know exactly, Anne Marie confessed. She and Peter were out somewhere together. And then there was a telephone call and there had been an accident. Mama and Papa rushed to the hospital. Remember, your mother came and stayed with me and Kirsty. Kirsty had already slept, had, was already asleep and she slept right through everything. She was so little then, but I stayed up and I was with your mother in the living room when my parents came home in the middle of the night and they told me Lizzie had died. I remember it was raining, Ellen said sadly. It was still raining the next morning when mama told me. Mama was crying and the rain made it seem as the whole world was crying. Amory finished brushing her long hair and handed her hairbrush to her best friend. Ellen undid her braids, lifted her dark hair away from the thin gold chain she wore around her neck, the chain that held the Star of David, and began to brush her thick curls. This is a picture of the necklace that, Anne, that Ellen would be wearing, but this is Anne Marie, so she would not be wearing that. I think it was partly because of the rain. They said she was hit by a car. I suppose the streets were slippery and it was getting dark, and maybe the driver just couldn't see. Emery went on remembering. Papa looked so angry. He made one hand do into a fist and kept pounding it into the other. I remember the noise of it. Slam, slam, slam. Together they got into the wide bed and pulled up the covers. Emery blew out the candle and drew the dark curtains aside so that the open window near the bed let in some air. See that blue trunk in the corner? She said, pointing through the darkness. Lots of Lizay's things are in there, even her wedding dress. Mama and Papa have never looked at those things, not since the day they packed them away. Ellen sighed. She would have looked so beautiful in her wedding dress. She had such a pretty smile. I used to pretend that she was my sister too. She would have liked that. Emery told her she loved you. That's the worst thing in the world, Ellen whispered, to be dead so young. I wouldn't want the Germans to take my family away, to make us live someplace else. But still, it wouldn't be as bad as being dead. Emery leaned over and hugged her. They won't take you away, she said. Not your parents either. Papa promised that they were safe, and he always keeps his promises. And you are quite safe here with us. For a while, they continued to murmur in the dark, but the murmurs were interrupted by yawns. Then Ellen's voice stopped. She turned over, and in a minute, her breathing was quiet and slow. Amory stared at the window where the sky was outlined and a tree branch moved slightly in the breeze. Everything seemed familiar, very comforting. 
Dangers were no more than odd imaginings like ghost stories that children made up to frighten one another. Things that couldn't possibly happen. Anne Marie felt completely safe here in her own home with her parents in the next room and her best friend asleep beside her. She yawned contentedly and closed her eyes. It was hours later, but still dark, when she was awakened abruptly by the pounding on the apartment door. Anne Marie eased the bedroom door open quietly. Only a crack and peeped out. Behind her, Ellen was sitting up, her eyes wide. She could see Mama and Papa in their night clothes moving about. Mama held a lighted candle, but as Anne Marie watched, she went to a lamp and switched it on. It was a long time since they had dared to use the strictly rationed electricity after dark that the light in the room seemed startling to Anne Marie. Watching through the slightly opened bedroom door, she saw her mother look automatically to the blackout curtains, making certain they were tightly drawn. <clears throat> and the Nazis told the um, Danish citizens they had to cover their windows in blackout curtains so that no light would shine out to the street. That was another one of their um, rules, requirements. Papa opened the front door to soldiers. This is the Johansson apartment. A deep voice asked the question loudly in the terribly accented Danish. Our name is on the door and I see you have a flashlight, Papa answered. What do you want? Is something wrong? I understand you are a friend of the neighbors, the Rosens, Mrs. Johansson. The soldier said angrily. Sophie Rosen is my friend. That is true. Mama said quietly, please, could you speak more softly? My children are asleep. Then you will be so kind as to tell me where the Rosens are. He made no effort to lower his voice. I assume they are home sleeping. It is four in the morning after all, Mama said. Amory heard the soldier stalk across the living room toward the kitchen. From her hiding place in the narrow sliver of open doorway, she could see the heavy uniformed man, a holstered pistol at his waist, in the entrance to the kitchen, peering in toward the sink. Another German voice said, the Rosen's apartment is empty. We are wondering if they might be visiting their good friends, the Johansons. Well, said Papa, moving slightly, so that he was standing in front of Amory's bedroom door, and she could see nothing except the dark blur of his back. As you see, you are mistaken. There is no one here but my family. You will not object if we look around. The voice was harsh and it was not a question. It seems we have no choice, Papa replied. Please don't wake my children, Mama requested again. There is no need to frighten little ones. The heavy booted feet moved across the floor again and into the other bedroom. A closet door opened and closed with a bang. Amory eased her bedroom door closed silently. She stumbled through the darkness to the bed. Ellen. She whispered urgently, take off your necklace. Ellen's hands flew to her neck. Desperately, she began trying to unhook the tiny clasp. Outside the bed bedroom door, the harsh voices and heavy footsteps continued. I can't get it open, Ellen said frantically. I never take it off. I can't even remember how to open it. Anne Marie heard a voice just outside the door. What is here? Shh, her mother replied. My daughter's bedroom. They are sound asleep. Hold still. Emery commanded, this will hurt. She grabbed the little gold chain and yanked with all of her strength and broke it. As the door opened and light flooded into the bedroom, she crumpled it into her hand and closed her fingers tightly. Terrified, both girls looked up at the three Nazi officers who entered the room. One of the men aimed a flashlight around the bedroom. He went to the closet and looked inside. Then with a sweep of his gloved hand, he pushed to the floor several coats and a bathrobe that hung from the pegs on the wall. There was nothing else in the room except a chest of drawers, the blue decorated trunk in the corner, and a heap of Kirstie's dolls piled in a small rocking chair. The flashlight beam touched each thing in turn. Angrily, the officer turned toward the bed. Get up, he ordered. Come out here. Trembling. The two girls rose from the bed and followed him, brushing past the two remaining officers in the doorway to the living room. Amory looked around. These three uniformed men were different from the ones on the street corner. The street soldiers were often young, sometimes ill at ease, and Amory remembered how the giraffe had, for a moment, let his harsh pose slip and had smiled at Kirsty. But these men were older, and their faces were set with anger. 
Her parents were standing beside each other, their faces tense, but Kirsty was nowhere in sight. Thank goodness that Kirsty slept through almost everything. If they had wakened her, she would be wailing, or worse, she'd be angry and her fists would fly. Your names, the officer barked. Anne-Marie Johansson, and this is my sister. Quiet! Let her speak for herself. Your name. He was glaring at Ellen. Ellen swallowed. Lise, she said and cleared her throat. <clears> Lise <throat> Johansson. The officer stared at them grimly. Now, Mama said in a strong voice, you have seen that we are not hiding anything. May my children go back to bed. The officer ignored her. Suddenly, he grabbed a handful of Ellen's hair. Ellen winced. He laughed scornfully. You have a blonde child sleeping in the other room. You have this blonde daughter. He gestured toward Anne-Marie with his head. Where did you get the dark-haired one? He twisted the lock of Ellen's hair. From a different father? From the milkman? Papa stepped forward. Don't speak to my wife in such a way. Let go of my daughter or I will report you for such treatment. Or maybe you got her for someplace else, the officer continued with a sneer. From the Rosens? For a moment, no one spoke. Then Anne-Marie, watching in panic, saw her father move swiftly to the small bookcase and take out a book. She saw that he was holding the family photograph album. Very quickly, he searched through its pages and found what he was looking for and tore out three pictures from three separate pages. He handed them to the German officer who released Ellen's hair. You will see each of my daughters with her names written on the photograph, Papa said. Emery knew instantly which photographs he had chosen. The album had many snapshots, all the poorly focused pictures of school events and birthday parties, but it also contained a portrait taken by a photographer of each girl as a tiny infant. Mama had written in her delicate handwriting the name of each baby daughter across the bottom of these photographs. She realized too with an icy feeling why Papa had torn them from the book. At the bottom of each page, below the photograph itself, was written the date and the realization Johansson had been born 21 years earlier. <clears throat> Kirsten Elizabeth, the officer read, looking at Kirsty's baby picture. He let the photograph fall to the floor. Anne Marie, he read next, glanced at her and dropped the second photograph. Lise Marguerite, he read finally and stared at Ellen for a long time. A long, unwavering moment in her mind. Emery pictured the photograph that he held. The baby, wide-eyed, propped against a pillow. Her tiny hand holding a silver teething ring. Her bare feet visible below the hem of an embroidered dress. The wispy curls, dark. The officer tore the photograph in half dropped the pieces to the floor. Then he turned the heels of his shiny boots grinding into the pictures and left the apartment. Without a word, the other two officers followed. Papa stepped forward and closed the door behind him. Anne-Marie relaxed. The clenched fingers of her right hand still clutched Ellen's necklace. She looked down and saw that she had imprinted the Star of David into her palm.